Hello, I'm Roxana Markoc, curator in the Department of Photography, and it is my great pleasure to welcome artist Taryn Simon, a living man declared dead, and other chapters is currently on view at the Museum of Modern Art. This major and complex project has been done over a period of four years, during which the artist traveled around the globe recording and researching bloodlines and their related stories. Everything from the first woman to hijack an aircraft to the living dead in India. The Museum of Modern Art is premiering this uh, exhibition here in the United States and is presenting nine of the 18 chapters that comprise this elaborate work. How did you arrive to, to this particular theme? In my past work, I was constantly indexing or cataloging things that had the appearance of being comprehensive. And I kept thinking in this work, where was there an absolute catalog, something that I could follow, directed without choice, I couldn't edit or curate. And that led me to blood, blood representing this absolute. And whether our fate is determined by chance, blood, or circumstance. External forces of governance, power, territory, and religion and those colliding with the internal forces of psychological and physical inheritance. I'm interested in the invisible space between text and image, how one informs and transforms the other back and forth, different forms of translation and transmission. It consists of three components, a portrait panel in which I systematically order the members of a given bloodline, a text panel in which I construct the narrative at stake, and a footnote panel in which I present photographic fragments of the story in a more intuitive, abstract, and disordered form. These three parts keep turning on each other and building different stories and readings depending on the way in which one chooses to navigate through them. The title, A Living Man Declared Dead in Other Chapters, refers to chapter one. I documented the descendants of a man who died and had four children who were going to inherit his land. And other family members had those four children declared dead so that they could seize the family's ancestral farmland in Uttar Pradesh, India. I photographed the members of this bloodline, four of whom are officially listed in the village registry as dead. They do not exist on paper and have been fighting to be reinstated as living. As a photographer, to take a photograph of someone who doesn't exist, it was a complicated and surreal engagement. You'll also see there are several empty portraits, and those blank portraits represent people who couldn't be photographed for different reasons. Dengue fever, imprisonment, army service. In chapter one, it was women who couldn't be granted permission to be photographed for religious and cultural reasons. The irony of the fact that I'm able to photograph the dead person, but I'm not able to photograph the officially living woman. We are all the living dead, and in many ways ghosts of the past and the future. And several of the stories that I document also function in that kind of archetypal form, where they feel like things that have happened before and will happen again. Bloodlines are often used in the studying of disease. In chapter six, I document three bloodlines of rabbits, which are being studied in a government program in Australia, in which they are testing the virulence of a disease that they will introduce into the natural rabbit population if its efficacy is proven. It is designed to kill off the rabbit population. In 1859, a British settler brought over 24 European rabbits to Australia, and within 100 years, the population had exploded to half a billion. And the Australian government is constantly spending tons of money to control population numbers, but rabbits are such prolific breeders, it's impossible. You have the bloodline of the rabbits, and then there's this other bloodline of the evolution of the disease itself, because as the rabbits become uh, more and more resistant, the disease has to get more virulent, and you have this kind of passage as well. All of the rabbits that you see in the photographs have been infected with a lethal disease. And in the footnote panel, there's a, a photograph of a chocolate bilby. Hayes Chocolate, in collaboration with Rabbit Free Australia, stopped all production of chocolate Easter bunnies because they're trying to replace the Easter bunny with the Easter bilby so that the population will celebrate an animal that they're comfortable with keeping alive and consequently be more comfortable with the killing of rabbits. 
In chapter seven, I focus on the effects of a genocidal act on one particular bloodline, and it's the only piece in which I visually represent the dead, those members of the bloodline who were killed in the Srebrenica massacre, which was the largest mass murder since the Second World War, when 8,000 Muslim Bosnian men and boys were systematically executed. The six members who died in the Srebrenica massacre are represented by both tooth and bone samples and also photographs of the fully assembled mortal remains of one individual. And the tooth and bone samples are these blue slides that are kept by the International Commission of Missing Persons. That's all that remains. And those samples were matched to DNA evidence collected from other bloodline members. But when I arrived in Bosnia, the, this, the woman Zumra, who is in the bloodline photographed, she lost her four children in the Srebrenica massacre. Her eldest son had just been dug up from a mass grave, so I was able to photograph the fully assembled mortal remains. And then in the footnote panel, you see video footage taken from the Milosevic trial, which shows a Serbian scorpion unit being blessed by an Orthodox priest before uh, rounding up the boys and men and killing them. You also see graffiti found on the battery factory wall where these executions occurred. My father is an avid photographer, as is my grandfather, but in very different forms. So my father had closets and closets full of Kodachrome slides. We would always have these slideshows, and it was how I, I learned about the broader world. He was traveling to Russia and Afghanistan and Iran and all these different places, and I always bringing home these images and these quite fantastical stories. So it was always about image and this associated text and my kind of imagined story that I found between those two, which definitely influenced the way in which I work now. And my grandfather, quite the opposite of my father, was much more into the, the kind of macro world. So he was all about insects and rocks and the stars and plants. And it was a very focused view, but again with uh, data collection and recordings. So it was always that combination, which is something that I've taken into my own practice. I mean, the work in the end, it's constructed almost as an archive. There's something that we can't completely understand and we want to remember and record, but it's not necessarily clear in whatever language we know and whatever documentation we've collected. It's in the space between all of it. So if anything, I want to lead to a certain disorientation and a, a further questioning of this kind of numbing persistence of birth and death and that these stories keep uh, coming and coming and questioning what it all amounts to.